Hey, what's up everybody? This is CLS All in One. This is part one of how to build a concrete block basement. This basement is 11 block courses high and around seven feet tall. And for this video, I'll be covering block courses one and two, plus go over quite a few basics for building a concrete block wall. But before I get started, I wanna share with you a little bit of the building process from start to finish. And I will be covering a lot of this project in future videos. I recently built an addition for my manufactured home. The addition is around 800 square feet with a concrete block basement. This is what it looked like before and this is after. As you can see here, our home looks drastically different now and it's quite a bit bigger as well. There was a lot of steps involved with this project. To start off with, I added a pure foundation to my existing home to give it proper support for my basement addition. After deciding the exact location of where I wanted my addition to be, we digged a giant hole in my front yard to begin making the concrete footer for the concrete blocks. The concrete footer is 16 inches wide by 16 inches tall, and the outside dimensions are around 16 foot 4 inches by 24 foot 4 inches, with vertical rebar in the center every 2 foot. And I do already have a video on how to build the concrete footer for the concrete blocks. And I'll make sure to post a link to that video in the description down below. And here is a little more preview of the building process for this edition. After laying 11 courses of block, we then poured a four inch thick concrete floor. Then installed a treated sill plate that was shimmed to fit tightly under the existing home. Then began installing the floor joists. After that, we installed the subfloor, then began framing, followed by OSB sheeting, house wrap, siding, and the roof trusses. After the structure was sealed, we then tore down the old exterior wall to open the addition to the main house for a much wider open floor plan. This addition changed our home from a three bedroom house to a five bedroom house plus an office. Now it's time to get started with building a concrete block basement. Now this is a dry basement, meaning it has no downstairs plumbing. Our house already has two bathrooms, which is plenty for us. But if you are trying to run utilities such as water and sewer, that usually needs to be done first. So my concrete footer is already in place with vertical rebar every two foot. It's sticking up about three and a half feet above the footer. And as I build the wall higher, I will have to add more vertical rebar as I go. The footer is squared up with the house and has a nice and level surface to make laying the blocks much easier. A lot of building codes only require vertical rebar every four foot, but I wanted my block wall to have a little more strength. So I decided to go every two foot. So what I'm doing here is making an outline of where my blocks will be located with a chalk line. My footer is 16 inches wide and I'll be centering the blocks right in the middle of the footer. So my chalk outline here is seven and five eighths of an inch wide. And the actual size of my concrete blocks is seven and five eighths of an inch wide by seven and five eighths of an inch tall and 15 and five eighths of an inch long but the nominal size would just be eight inches by eight inches by 16 inches. The blocks are designed to have a layer of mortar around them that's three eighths of an inch thick, which then gives them an accurate height of eight inches and a length of 16 inches. It's best when possible to build a block structure like this with dimensions that keep you from having to cut the blocks. My basement is 16 feet wide by 24 feet long, which works out perfect with my blocks. I was able to start off with 12 blocks for the width and 17 blocks for the length, which matches right up to the 16 foot by 24 foot dimensions. But if you do end up having to cut some blocks, there is plenty of saws out there available if necessary. So on the footer, I've marked exactly where the blocks would be placed, including where they start and where they end. And I also made some small marks every 16 inches where a block will be placed. On this section of the course, there is 12 blocks placed at every 16 inches with the back of the block lining up with my 16 inch marks, which leaves a gap of 3 eighths of an inch between the blocks for the mortar. Staging all the needed materials is an important step and in my case required quite a bit of labor. I had Menards deliver a lot of the materials, including a pallet of mortar and multiple pallets of blocks. This block basement is 11 courses high and has around 58 blocks per course which ends up being around 638 blocks. But I ended up ordering around 650 blocks, so I had a few extra on hand, in case any of the blocks were damaged. Each pallet of blocks 
contains around 11 corner blocks with no flanges and 49 standard blocks that contain flanges. I also ordered around 20 half blocks for window openings and various other spots. And one more thing I would like to mention pertaining to the blocks. Most blocks will have a webbing that's larger on one side than the other. The larger webbing should face up. This allows for a larger mortar bed and less mortar waste. But if you do mistakenly lay a block with the larger webbing down, it will still function just fine, as I found out by making this mistake myself in the beginning of the build. To move the blocks, we found the slide to be very helpful. After getting a big batch of blocks and mortar stacked by the concrete footer, it was time to start mixing the mortar. For the mortar, we used the Type S pre-blended mix that you just add water to. And I recommend starting with mixing just one bag at a time if you're a beginner so the mortar doesn't dry or set up before you can use all of it. When mixing it, it calls for four and a half quarts of water per 80 pound bag of mortar. It may take slightly more or less depending on the weather conditions, but the consistency you're looking for is a mix that's fairly wet and workable, but still firm enough to stay on your trowel when turned sideways, as demonstrated right here. So before I start laying any block, I would like to go over some of the tools I used for this job. Water on the work site is extremely important, so I have a hose here with an adjustable spray nozzle ready to go. I use the water mainly to mix with the mortar and keep my tools clean, so it's a good idea to have multiple 5 gallon buckets on the job site filled with water for cleaning the tools. To mix the mortar, I used a wheelbarrow and a square point shovel, and to keep the mortar from drying too quickly, I kept the wheelbarrow covered with plywood, which worked fairly well. When laying the mortar, you want to have a decent amount of the mortar right next to you. So what I normally do is fill a 5 gallon bucket half full and have that right next to me so I can just scoop out of that whenever I need with my trowel. But what also worked good for me was this scrap piece of plexiglass. This is around 16 inches wide and 20 inches long and quarter inch thick. And this made spreading the mortar a little bit easier for me, but this is definitely not necessary. Another important tool would be a mason trowel. Also, a bucket trowel, pointing trowel, and finishing trowel will come in handy. And here's a couple other tools I used. A chalk line, tape measure, carpenter pencil, torpedo level, rubber mallet, masonry hammer, and a block line stretcher along with string line. And I will demonstrate how this works later in the video. I also used a brick or block jointer to finish the mortar joints, and I'll demonstrate that as well later in the video. Now it's time to start laying the mortar in the corner of the concrete footer that you want to start with. The mortar should be laid at 3 quarters of an inch to 1 inch thick inside the lines that you have marked for the block. Right now, I'm only laying one block to start with, and the mortar is only needed in this area. So let's take a quick look at this bed of mortar I just laid. I have what I'm going to describe as tracks of mortar that are around 1 inch high and 2 inches wide that outlines the corner and sides of where the block will be placed. So in placing this block in the corner, I have to lift it up and over the rebar, then gently lay it in place, while being careful not to push down too hard on either side of the block because you want to maintain a 3 8 inch thick layer of mortar underneath the block. Now before continuing, I would like to explain when corner blocks should be used. If you take a look at this standard block, you'll notice the outside edges have flanges that don't look so nice. So normally you'd want to use a corner block right here, but this block will end up being buried on the outside, so the flanges will not be visible. And I do have a limited amount of corner blocks on hand that I need to save for other areas on the block basement. And here's a quick look at one type of corner block that has a flat outside edge. And here's an example of a corner block being used on my block basement circled here in red. Now I would recommend if you do have enough corner blocks available, you should use them on all the corners, regardless if they're visible or not, because your mortar joints will be easier to work with. Okay, now it's time to get back to laying some blocks. So right here, I'm carefully placing my first block into position, using the marks on my footer for reference, which are slightly covered with mortar, so I will have to double check the correct position here in a few. Now it's time to gently tap the block down using the back of a trowel or a rubber mallet. And what you're trying to achieve here is a 3 8 of an inch layer of mortar under the block. 
For this step, I usually just tap it down evenly until it looks close to 3 8 of an inch. Now it's time to grab my torpedo level to ensure it's level and my tape measure to ensure the height of the block is 8 inches. With the level, I check side to side and front to back and tap down where necessary to get a measurement of 8 inches from the top of the footer to the top of the block on all four corners. So for my basement, if I have a block that drops below 8 inches, I would just consider that practice and it's time for me to try again. This is my starting block, so for me, it's crucial that it's just right. After getting the block level and the correct height, it's time to cut the mortar away with the trowel. When cutting, I just keep the trowel flush with the faces of the block, and the mortar cuts really easy. Sometimes you can save this extra mortar, but most of the time, it's not worth the effort. After cutting the mortar away, it's time to double check the position of my block in reference with the chalk lines. My block is just slightly off, so I'm giving it just a couple small taps to get it lined up correctly with the chalk lines. Now normally, when doing corners, I would lay tracks of mortar for two blocks at a time in each corner, like this, then set and level the two blocks at the same time. But I'm trying to break this down step by step, so for now, I'm just laying one block at a time. Okay, now it's time for the second block, which will be going the other direction and connecting to the first block I just laid. So I will start off with laying out some tracks of mortar that are around 17 inches long, one inch high, and two inches wide. Now it's time to add mortar to the block edges, which is commonly called buttering the block. So what I'm doing here is applying mortar to the outside edges of the block that's about one inch high, two inches wide, and tapered to kind of a V shape. When applying the mortar, I firmly press down at about a 45 degree angle, which helps the mortar stick to the block. This step will take a lot of practice to get down, and more than likely, you're gonna end up with some mortar falling off your blocks in the beginning. Now it's time to set this block, and I do have to lift this one over the rebar as well. When setting this block in place, I try to make slight contact with the edges first, then the bottom. Here's an up close look at another block being set in place from a different angle. And while setting this block in place, I make sure to be careful not to move my first block. Once the block is set, it's time to tap it down to the same height as the first block. This block should be set 16 inches from the first block with a 3 8 of an inch layer of mortar between the two blocks and a 3 8 of an inch layer of mortar underneath the block as well. And it should also be centered with the chalk lines and have an approximate height of eight inches and be level with the first block. So it's pretty much the same routine as the first block. Once it's level and matching the first block, go ahead and cut the mortar away. So this corner is now done and it's time to start on the other side. And again, I'm just laying one block at a time and pretty much copying what I just did on the other corner. So I'll start off here with laying my tracks of mortar and a lot of people refer to this as laying a bed of mortar, but I'm just saying tracks of mortar because that's what it looks like. Now I'll set the first block on this side and try to position it as close as possible to the chalk lines. And now since I already have one block that's in perfect position, I'm gonna go ahead and use my tape measure and measure the distance across and make sure it's exactly where it should be, which is 16 foot. If I need to make any adjustments, I can just use my rubber mallet and tap it whichever direction it needs to go. Once I have it approximately where it should be, it's time to go ahead and tap it down and make sure it's level and measuring at eight inches. After getting it leveled out, I can go ahead and cut the extra mortar away. Now it's time to lay my second block on this corner. So I have to lay out my tracks of mortar first, then butter the edges of my block, then set it in place. Now it's time to match the height of the first block on this corner. So I'm gonna go ahead and tap it down into position, then level it out, then cut the mortar away. Now if you do end up with a mortar joint that needs more mortar, sometimes you can just pack it in from the side with a trowel. But in situations where the block ends up more than 1 8 of an inch low, it might be worthwhile to just start over with setting the block. So I now have two corners done, and I can start laying the blocks in between. But before I do this, I'll go ahead and finish the other two corners first so everything is ready to go. To finish the other corners, you can just repeat the same steps as the first two corners. 
but this time you could try laying both corner blocks at the same time as demonstrated right here on my second course of blocks. So what I've done here is laid out the mortar for two blocks to be set at the same time. Here is the first block and here is the second block. Once the blocks are set in place, I tap them both down to the correct height while keeping the blocks level with each other. Then once they're in final position, I cut the mortar away. So this method is pretty close to being the same routine, only you're doing two blocks at a time. So I now have all four corners done, and it's time to use my block line stretcher. Here's a look at one of my line stretchers, and this is a very simple tool to use. I start by tying a string line to one of my line stretchers right here. Now I'm going to head over to my corner block and place my line stretcher on top of the block with my string line attached. You'll start off by placing it on there straight, then turn it sideways and it will lock into position. Then while we'll keeping tension on the string line, I'll walk over to the next corner where I'm going to use another line stretcher. Then with plenty of tension on the string line, I wrap it around the second line stretcher, then pull it tight and place it on the block, then lock it by turning it sideways. The block line stretchers can be mounted on the inside or the outside of the blocks. Now I have a nice and level string line I can follow to lay my blocks. This string line marks the proper height and inside placement on the footer, which is going to make it much easier to lay the blocks in between the corners right here. The blocks will be placed every 16 inches. If I measure from the outside edge of the corner block that I'm starting with, I can make a mark every 16 inches. And for each block that I lay in between the corners, the back of the block will line up with my 16 inch mark and give me a 3 8 of an inch gap for mortar between each block. When using this method, you want to be very accurate with your measurements and also confirm the 16 inch spacing for the blocks works out correctly by making marks and confirming each block will fit before laying any of the blocks. This side is 16 feet and 12 blocks across. And when using this 16 inch spacing, everything fits just as it should. Now it's time to lay the blocks in between the corners. And I'll start off with laying a bed of mortar, then butter the edge of the block. So if you are a beginner when laying these blocks in between, I'd recommend laying a bed of mortar for only one or two blocks at a time. So the mortar doesn't set up and start to dry. So I'm lifting this block up and over the rebar and placing it into position. Then I tap it down to the same height as my string line. Then I line up the back of the block with my 16 inch mark. So the edge of this block lines up with the string line as well as the height. Once it's in the correct position, I make sure it's level, then cut the mortar away, but leave the mortar on the front side of the block for the next block. And just to let you know, measuring the height of the blocks that's in between the corners will not be necessary now because we can use our string line as the guide for the height. So here is a closer look at setting a block in place. I try to line up the back of the block with my 16 inch mark as I set it in the mortar, then tap it down to the same height as the string line, then level the block and tap it down where necessary while keeping the edge of the block lined up with my string line. So it looks like this side of the block needs a few taps to make it level. And now everything looks good. Now I can cut the mortar away. And what works really well for me is to lightly pack the mortar into the joints first, then cut it away. And this gives me a nice full joint with no voids. So as you can see here, I'm just lightly packing it with my trowel. Then I cut it away and it cuts really easy. Now I'd like to show you more of the string line with a couple blocks in place. So here's a course that's close to being done. And as you can see, that string line is right at the edge of the block. Let's take a closer look. So this string line is matching the height of the block, plus it's matching the edge of the block, which gives me a nice straight line for my blocks to follow. Now let's continue on with the first course. So to start with on this course, I just did one block at a time because I was by myself. But by the time I got to the end, I did have a little bit of help so I could get a couple blocks going at once. So I'm laying out mortar for three different blocks right here. I'm gonna grab a block that has been buttered and set that in place. Match it up to the string line, check for level. And this one needs a little bit of adjustment. I gotta tap it forward just a little bit to line it up with my 16 inch mark. And here's the next block. And now it's time for the closure block. So this block can be a little tricky. A method that works well for me 
is to butter the edges of one of the blocks that's already on the footer. Then butter the edge of the block to be placed on the footer as well. Now carefully slide it into position while keeping the block level and even on the edges. More than likely, you will lose some mortar once setting this block into position. If that happens, you can just pack mortar in the gaps from the side with a trowel. Or you could just completely fill the closure block gaps like this. So in this example, I'm filling the entire gap between the blocks from the top by packing it in with a trowel. Then once it's full, I cut the excess mortar away. And once that's done, I end up with two solid mortar joints on my closure block. Now it's time to finish the mortar joints. As soon as the mortar is thumbprint hard, you can finish the joints with a brick or block jointer. This one is 3 8 of an inch on one side and half inch on the other, and works well. You just dip this in the water, then start finishing the joints. This will round the joints and seal them as well. And I would recommend to keep a small bucket of water handy so you can keep dipping the jointer in the water, and this will make finishing the joints much easier. Now let's go ahead and take a close up look. So before my mortar joint was somewhat flat with the face of the block. And now you can see it's somewhat rounded looking. And this helps seal that joint a little bit better and gives it more of a finished look. So now it's time to finish the first course. And everything from this point on, on this course, will be pretty repetitive. It's going to be the same routine. You're going to lay the mortar out on the footer first, then butter your block, then place your block in a position, level it with a string line, then cut the mortar away, then move on to the next block. So my first course is just about done now. I just got two blocks left to go. I just need to finish my bed and mortar here between the blocks, then butter the edge of my block here. And again, I try to get kind of a V shape to it. Now I'm gonna flip the block and butter this edge and kind of shape it like a V. Now I can set this block in place and then the final block, which is the closure block. And now my first course is done. Now it's just about time to lay the second course of block. But before I start that, I want to talk about filling the cells with grout. Every block on the footer that has vertical rebar running through it should be filled with grout. If you want to, you can fill the cells with grout after each course you lay. But I prefer to wait and fill the cells after laying at least four to five courses a block. For my block basement, I decided to fill every cell to make my wall completely solid, but this is just my preference and not necessary. Most building codes require only filling the cells that have vertical rebar. To fill the cells on my block wall, I used a concrete truck along with a slide to help guide the grout into the holes. And for the areas on my block wall that could not be reached, I just had to use a five gallon bucket. And here's one more thing I would like to mention that does pertain to the cells. The vertical rebar will more than likely need extensions to make it to the top of the wall. The rebar extensions can just be overlapped with the existing rebar by around 16 inches or more with a small bend at the end of the rebar extension. The rebar extension can just be tied to the existing rebar with wire. And once this cell is filled with grout, it becomes a solid structure. Okay, let's move on to the second course. So just like the first course of blocks, I start with the corner blocks, but this time I'm laying both corner blocks at the same time. And I'm also staggering the blocks by eight inches. So this course overlaps my first course by half a block. For these corner blocks, I laid a bed of mortar on the first course of blocks that's around one inch high and the same width as the webbing of the block. Since my first course of blocks are already in perfect position, these blocks just need to be squared up with the outside edges of the first course for the correct placement. Once the blocks are in position, they need to be leveled and set to a height of eight inches, measuring from the top of the previous course to the top of this course. After leveling the blocks, the mortar can be cut away. I then use a straight edge to confirm the blocks are square with the previous course. Now I just need to repeat this process with the remaining three corners. So here is some info regarding the staggering of the blocks. It changes the amount I need for each side. On the first course of blocks, it was 12 blocks wide by 17 blocks long. But on the second course, it's 11 blocks wide and 18 blocks long. And this will continue to alternate with each course. Okay, now I have all four corners done and ready to go. 
and it's time to measure out for some blocks in between the corners. So this time I'm going to measure from the inside the blocks and make a mark every 16 inches. And these marks indicate where the front of each block I'm going to be laying on this side is going to be located. And just like before, you want to measure and make your marks all the way across and make sure the placement of your blocks fits correctly all the way to your next corner block. After confirming the measurements, it's time to use the line stretchers again and get the string line set up. Then start laying some blocks. Here's an example from the fourth course. So it's pretty much the same routine as setting blocks on the first course. But instead of applying mortar to the inside of the chalk lines, I'm now applying mortar to the top of the blocks. That's around one inch high in the width of the block webbing. Now let's check out a different example with a closer look from a different course. I got tracks and mortar laid out on the outside webbing of the blocks, along with 16 inch marks on the previous course blocks and a string line to guide the block placement. So right here, I'm tapping the block into position to get it to line up with my 16 inch marks in the string line. Now I'm gonna grab my level to ensure that it's level both directions. Everything looks good. So now I'm gonna cut the mortar away, then continue on with the next block. So this becomes very repetitive. I grab my block that has the buttered edges, tap it into position, make sure it lines up with my marks in the string line, level it, then cut the mortar away. And don't forget, once that mortar is thumbprint dry, you wanna go ahead and finish it with the jointer. So that's about it for this video. For block courses one through two, I did try to cover a lot of the basic stuff and some extras as well. And hopefully this video helped you out. If you like this video, if you could hit that like button and have yourself a great day and I'll see you next time. And now I'm going to leave you with a quick preview of part two, where I'll be covering how to install electrical and side block walls and how to make bond beams for block walls as well.